We uh, have some time for questions, and um, we have right in the center here a microphone. Um, so I hope you won't be shy. Uh, how about coming to the microphone with questions? Um, if you're too far away, you can stand up where you are, and I'll repeat the question. But, I, but if we can use the mic, I think it's going to be the best system. So how about if we let you get started, sir? Is this on? I guess it is. Uh, let me tell you a problem that I have when I consider all the religions out there. Each one contends that it possesses the absolute truth. And I've always wondered, how are we going to reach compromise or consensus among the many religions in the world when each one says that it possesses the absolute truth? How do you reach compromise in that context? I think the way to do that is to separate the realm of theology from the realm of morality. Or to put it somewhat differently, to separate the realm of revelation from the realm of reason. Uh, in religion, you have a component of both. To take Christianity, for example, um, Aquinas, in one of his writings, argues that he says, I think I can prove the existence of God. That's based on reason. But the Trinity, that falls in the domain of revelation. You have to take that one on faith. Now, I think that in a democratic society, our society, or in a global world, you can't make revelation the basis of common ground, obviously, because there are competing revelations. So I think that revelation has got to be, you might say, kept in the private sphere. It can't be the basis for the shared ground. But it's actually quite interesting. Um, years ago, the theologian Hans Kung assembled what he called a parliament of religions. He got representatives of innumerable religions together and discovered that while they disagree dramatically about theology, they agree surprisingly about morality. The disagreements about morality tend to be not disagreements about principle, but disagreements about application. In a given circumstance, there could be a disagreement about how to apply this rule, sometimes because there's a competing value involved. So bottom line, I think that morality is the meeting point um, of the religions of the world. And it's quite possible to have both intelligent debate about morality, and it's possible to find considerable common ground on it as well. I'm a public school teacher, and I have an 18-year-old who claims to be an atheist because she doesn't see the point. Now, of course, she's an 18-year-old senior in high school and knows everything. Um, but how can I respond to her outside of my own personal prayerfulness for her and help her to come to an understanding of atheism really isn't going to help her through life? The, um, my own daughter is 14. Uh, she hasn't um, progressed as far as yours. Um, but um, I recognize the phenomenon. And I think that for many of our young people, particularly as they get a first whiff of freedom, they almost want to take a little bit of a short vacation from Christianity. They feel that from the time they were three or four, it's been drummed into them. She hasn't had it, in this case, drummed into her. Well, the, I can't speak to her case specifically, but let me say more broadly that um, in some senses, um, a lot of young people in our society are very hard to persuade because they have become a little hardened against Christianity. Uh, people say there's all this paganism among young people, but I agree with C.S. Lewis. He says, oh, in a sense, that a, that a um, person who has been divorced doesn't thereby become a virgin. 
point he's trying to get at is if you've been through Christianity and in some senses become toughened against it, you're not in the position who's never heard of the person who's never heard about it at all. In fact, it's a lot easier to go to Nigeria uh, or Seoul, South Korea and can convert a guy who's never heard about it than it is to go to France and con convert a guy who's hardened against it because he feels, I've been through that. I know what it's about. And at the age of 18, as you say, lots of young people feel they know what it's about. In a sense, what they're doing is an understandable process. They are substituting one set of prejudices for another. We have to admit that the Christianity that we impose on young people is largely done as a matter of prejudice. By prejudice, what I mean is they aren't thinking it through. It's being delivered to them. So they want to break out of that and think for themselves. That's not an unhealthy process. The problem is they imbibe a new set of prejudices which they mistake for reason itself. And, and it's going to take a little bit of time to see that they've exchanged one set of suppositions for another. Then begins the tough process of beginning to assess the two. But I can't tell you how many campuses I speak at where the typical question, Mr. D'Souza, you know, has it occurred to you? That kind of question, which is aimed at articulating this sort of undergraduate sense of freedom and brilliance. Uh, <laughs> And, and, in fairness, these young people are picking up some thoughtful stuff from their teachers. I'll give one brief example. When I debated Daniel Dennett on his home campus Tufts, he started a freethinker society, and he has all these acolytes who have all basically, you've seen Dennett, he's a little bit like a Santa Claus. And what's amusing is to look in the audience and see 30 undergraduate Santa Clauses, uh, <laughs> all miniature Dennett's. So one of them stands up and says, Mr. D'Souza, has it occurred to you? And he says, um, I want to acquaint you with the principle of parsimony. Like the principle of parsimony. He says, the principle of parsimony states that there are two ways for something to be true. Now, pay attention for a second. This is kind of interesting. He says, something can be true by definition, such as if you say all bachelors are single, true by definition. Or something can be true by empirical verification, meaning it's true by going and looking at the facts. So if somebody said that there is a tiger in the next room, we don't know. We've got to go see. And his argument is that something is not true by definition or by empirical verification. It's not only untrue, it's utterly meaningless. So he says to me, let's subject the idea of God to this test. Is God self-evidently true? No. No one would claim that the presence of God is self-evident. Well, is God, can God's presence be verified by empirical verification? No. We have no way to conduct a scientific test to figure out if God exists. So he goes, based on that, I say God only, does not only not exist, it's a meaningless concept. We should throw it out. So I said to him, well... Never quite heard of the principle of parsimony put that way. But I said, let's explore it for a moment. You say things can be true by either self-evidently or by empirical checking. Let's subject the principle of parsimony to this test. For example, is it self-evidently true? No. Is it true by empirical verification? No. Therefore... It's not only wrong, it's meaningless, and we can throw it out. Um, now, the reason I tell you this is that to have this kind of discussion in a university setting, young people love this stuff because they are easily drawn to these types of arguments, but they love to hear them refuted. Uh, and so this is the value of apologetics in today's culture. Um, what Dennett is looking for is for me to throw Bible verses at him, cite encyclicals, appeal to tradition and authority. He's ready for that. But what he's not used to is having his own ideas subjected to skepticism itself. Uh, and uh, that's, that puts Christianity back into the debate. Yes, sir.